The logo for the Kansas State School for the Blind, a flying blue eagle in the center of a red and yellow sunflower. KSSB presents Microsoft Soundscape Overview and Q&A with Jarnell Chudge. This video has audio description and captions. Jarnell shares his screen. It reads, Microsoft Soundscape, lighting up the world with sound. Jarnell Chudge, Innovation Architect, Microsoft Technology and Research. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present to you and uh, uh, your colleagues on, uh, on Soundscape. My intention is to sort of keep the presentation, I always say 20 to 25 minutes, but invariably end up taking longer. But I wanted this to be really informal. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask questions, uh, fire them off to uh, Medley, feel free to sort of uh, interrupt at any time. And uh, I think we've got about an hour, just under an hour or so. Um, and, and, and don't think that any topic is off the, uh, the table um, either. Um, and I'll do my uh, level best to uh, um, answer all of those questions. What I'm hoping to sort of get out of this for yourselves is um, certainly an understanding and appreciation of what Soundscape is and how it works, share a little bit about the, the journey and the rationale for why we've designed things the way that we have in Soundscape. And uh, hopefully at the end of that, uh, leave you all infused to uh, want to try it out, learn more, use it in ways that maybe you're not using it now, um, and so on. So hopefully as a uh, 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 overview and set of uh, objectives for the session, uh, they, uh, they kind of make sense. In terms of uh, starting off by doing a little bit of framing around uh, inclusive design. This slide reads, inclusive design, a design methodology that enables and draws on the full range of human diversity, a line drawing of various people with a variety of jobs and abilities. Now, certainly within Microsoft over the last, what, seven, eight years in particular, this has really become a cornerstone of how we design our products and services. Um, there was a, almost a movement, it felt, inside the company that wanted to reinvigorate our existing uh, uh, technologies and services and uh, allow us to be more inclusive in terms of who we design for. I mean, as a company, we have this grand mission of uh, you know, enabling every person on the planet to achieve more. And when we say every person, it kind of has to be every person. And we know that certainly in the past, and we've been guilty of this, where accessibility, for example, has been something which has been bolted on after the core features and functions have been built for sighted and, and, and able-bodied uh, users, shall we say. And what we try to do with inclusive design is to sort of turn that around a little bit. And I think the work that we were doing with Soundscape provided this perfect example of how actually by starting with that intense focus on what has often been a Ferroni said neglected group of people, but if you start with them and you do so in a way which is uh, um, inclusive, that involves them in every step of the way of the, uh, the whole design and, and engineering process, then you give yourself the opportunity of coming up with innovations that um, actually make a difference, but also have uh, hopefully broader potential and broader appeal uh, as well. And certainly within Microsoft, one of the shifts that we made was not thinking about disability as a personal health condition but rather as a mismatch between the person and the things that they want to do. The way that they uh, want to engage in the environment with other people, tasks using technology uh, and, and so on. And use that to also build stronger design empathy within our designers and within our engineers uh, as well. Because we can all, and we all recognize uh, experience and dis um, uh, exp we all experience disability and exclusion, and we all uh, sort of recognize it uh, um, in our lives in one way or, or another. And of course, this ranges from a permanent disability, such as a, a person with one arm, but equally a person with an arm injury will experience on a temporary basis, what's it like not to be able to use that uh, arm? Or situationally, uh, a parent carrying a newborn baby or, a, uh, or holding some shopping bags, uh, once again, will experience, uh, not of course to the same extent, but they'll experience the uh, um, exclusion of not being able to uh, work in the way that perhaps they've become uh, accustomed to. And of course, throughout history, there've been great examples where uh, some of the innovations that are absolutely fundamental to our day lives 
actually came out of, uh, of, of, of disability. So, for example, we know that um, there's Alexander Graham Bell, you know, one of the uh, uh, inventors, let's say, of the, uh, the modern telephone, really was motivated to work in that space because he wanted to help uh, people who were, uh, who were deaf or uh, who were hard of hearing. Um, Pellegrino Turi uh, created a typewriter, what is now known as a typewriter, and of course has evolved into the keyboard because he wanted to communicate to his blind uh, partner. Um, Vint Cerf, now with Google, of course, uh, we're sort of familiar with him as one of the fathers of the, the internet, creating those first protocols so that once again, he wanted to be able to communicate with his wife. Um, it was the, the, the space age uh, of the last sort of 40, 50 years uh, you know, recognized that uh, absolutely essential to wear these big bulky suits, but of course they restricted mobility quite significantly. So the creation of joysticks, as just one example that came out of um, you know, that particular uh, uh, initiative, but which we all in many ways take for, uh, for granted now. So how does that apply to Soundscape? Hopefully over the course of the next uh, little while, some of that will be uh, clearer. The slide reads, The Quest. We set out to empower people with sight loss to be mobile and independent by using an inclusive design that provides a better experience for everyone. There are three photos. Each photo features a gentleman with a blue sweater and a yellow lab guide dog. In the first photo, the gentleman and the guide dog are at a bus station. In the second photo, the gentleman and the guide dog are at a mall. And in the third photo, the gentleman is seated at a picnic table in a park. Gosh, it was just over 10 years ago that we started working with guide dogs, um, the NGO here in the UK. And they're uh, certainly in the UK, one of the most uh, loved and well-known um, um, organizations. Uh, as kids, uh, they used to appear on this children's TV show in the day when there were only, I think, three TV channels in the UK. So everybody grew up um, you know, watching Blue Peter. And one of the things that Blue Peter did, as the name of the show, was uh, sponsor a guide dog. And uh, so this became sort of almost uh, interwoven into uh, the fabric of childhood uh, growing up. But about 10 years ago, we started working with uh, guide dogs and we described it as a quest looking at how technology could help people with blindness to be more mobile and to be more independent. But to think about doing it in a way where the value would accrue to everyone, because certainly guide dogs uh, through various uh, technology initiatives that they had been involved in recognized that uh, technology that's almost sort of designed exclusively for a blind person can often be seen as having that strong association with uh, with a disability and pointing it out as such. And uh, there's often, you know, stigma attached to these, these, these what were described as beige boxes in people's houses that allowed them to interact with technology or TV and things like that. So the idea was thinking about it from a mainstream point of view so that um, it, more people that use it gives it the greater chance of... Uh, being adopted, being successful, and, and being sustainable over the uh, the longer term. And one of the things that we did initially uh, 10 years ago was to produce this concept video. And as part of that concept video, looked at um, the idea of a family day out, the central character, Bill, is blind, is organizing that family day out. And over the course of the day, he's dealing with uh, travel disruption, having a picnic in the park, doing some shopping, and joining the exhibits at the Natural History Museum. I remember we did this in 2012, but we were thinking about five to seven years out into the future. We didn't want to think, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years out in the future because then it would have just felt like science fiction be very hard to relate to. So we wanted to uh, think about technologies which were uh, just becoming available or were just uh, visibly on the uh, horizon and uh, imagine the sort of role uh, that they could uh, play. And as a result of that, uh, uh, producing that film, the natural inclination, of course, was to think about uh, machine vision, computer vision in some way, uh, replacing the, uh, the lack or the loss of sight. The slide reads, Soundscape acts as an audio display to enrich your experience of your surroundings. Heads up, attentive and engaged. The photo shows a gentleman wearing headphones and holding his cell phone in his hand as he uses soundscape on a busy city street. He has a yellow lab guide dog. There were a whole recent set of reasons why we didn't do that, and uh, I'll, I'll say that for another time. 
But it was during a research visit that we were doing in London with um, um, a group of uh, people with blindness, with orientation and mobility instructors, that uh, my co-partner in all of this, uh, Amos Miller, was blind, a guide dog owner, and he was the one who actually made the initial introduction to guide dogs. Uh, it was during that research visit, a couple of days afterwards, when he and I were reflecting on it, we recalled the fountain in a small courtyard in London that we could hear but not always see. And depending on where the sound of that water was coming from, whether it was ahead of us or behind us or to the side, we always kind of knew where we were in relation to it. And in that way, it sort of helped anchor us to the space that uh, we were exploring and, and, and walking around at that time. And that's when we thought about using and really doubling down and using sound as a way of enhancing our awareness and our appreciation of the environment. So we often like to think of soundscape as an audio display rather than a, a visual display that we're familiar with uh, on our phones and on our uh, various uh, devices and so on. And it allows us to, uh, hopefully you'll see this as well, uh, to be more engaged with uh, what's going on around us. Because we know right now the technology, when we're using it, it demands our uh, complete attention, especially our phones. Even when uh, you know, we're sat down for a few moments or we're out and about walking, the number of people have the phone in their hands, not paying attention to what's going on around them and the people that they're with, it's all too uh, familiar. So instead, uh, hopefully by creating an experience that doesn't rely on the screen so much, but allows you to interact um, with the sound around you, uh, then it can lead to a more heads up experience, which then leads into what, what exactly is soundscape. And we describe it as a, um, a map, a navigation tool that uh, we deliver in 3D audio, in particular spatial audio. So the illustration on this slide, we've got a couple of... Um, your figure standing outside a, uh, a Starbucks coffee. And uh, what Soundscape does is it provides call outs from the place around you. And this could be landmarks, points of interest, intersections, whatever you may yourself have tagged in the environment. But it calls them out from where they are in relation to you. And in the case of the illustration here, you'll either hear it behind and to your right or behind and to your left because that's where you are in relation to where uh, Starbucks is. And with Soundscape, what we're able to do is to make that sound appear to come about a meter outside of your head. Even though you're wearing stereo headphones in order to get the spatial audio uh, effect, we, through uh, the magic of software, are able to fool the brain into thinking that that sound is about a meter outside of your head. And that's really important because uh, that then allows us to localize it. That then allows us to more accurately determine or position where something is in relation to us. And of course, when Soundscape is doing this in a very dynamic way, the tagline that I had in the opening slide about lighting up the world around you, then that's what uh, starts to happen a little bit. And I'll illustrate this with a, uh, a very short video with uh, Gertrude Amos and our, uh, and our friend uh, and colleague uh, Emily. Hello and welcome. We are going to demonstrate how I use Soundscape. I have my friend Emily here with me. Hi there. And my guide dog Trevor. You're going to hear and experience Soundscape in the same way that I do through these headsets. So let's go. Facing north along 101st Avenue South. East. So Emily, where should we go? I hear there's a place called Local Burger nearby. Would you like to try it? Let's do it. I'll set a beacon to it. Now I can hear the beacon over in front of us and to our right, that's where the local burger is. Excellent, that beacon's really helpful as I can't see past these trees. Fantastic, so let's go there. All right. Instead of step-by-step -step instructions, Soundscape lets me hear where the destination is so I can Coaching make my way there. Main street, We're coming up to an right. intersection Main here. Goes right. Crossing. Here's the crossing. Listen to the traffic. Are we safe to cross? All right, and it's safe to cross. Front do it. Hey, here's Franz chocolate over there. Oh, perfect. Hedging we should fine. set a marker there on our way back. Now I can hear the beacon loud and clear on my right, so we'll turn right. Facing north along And here Main it Street. comes right in front of us, so we know we're walking straight towards it. Forum Plaza. 
on Main Street and straight Bustle towards the beacon. We're going to start hearing it coming on our left as we get close to the local burger. Joseph Jewelry. And beacon close by. I can see the door. Ah, here we are. Fantastic. Emily, thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for listening. So for the, uh, I guess, the technically uh, minded amongst you, uh, in order to deliver this sort of spatial audio experience as shown on this uh, very simplified uh, diagram, it requires the use of um, stereo headphones. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more uh, detail as well. Currently, we're only available on, on iPhone. Um, and the reason for that is uh, simply when we started this work, the majority of uh, simply the people that we're working with and in the uh, markets that we've released in, the majority of uh, people in the blind and low vision community had or uh, have access to, uh, to an iPhone. And of course, there's a whole services layer, which is powered by our uh, Microsoft Cloud. And then the data itself that we rely on comes from a combination of OpenStreetMap, which is a, um, a community sourced uh, data set. And uh, each week, we basically ingest all of the updates that people have been making around the world. And this runs into millions and millions of items. And that then is supported by data from our own uh, search engine and, and, and uh, map provider Bing. And talking a little bit about the journey that we've been on on uh, Sciencecape over the last uh, 10 years uh, or so. The slide reads, learnings and insights. A phase one user journey summary. Phase one philosophy is heads down, withdrawn from the world, prescriptive, fine-grained navigation, attention focused on accuracy, labor-intensive manual data input, costly to scale. Phase two philosophy reads, heads up, engaging with the world, descriptive, coarse-grained navigation, attention focused on awareness, crowdsourced data, scales organically. We, um released into the App Store just over four years ago. But prior to that, as you can imagine, after the initial content video, there was a huge amount of uh, research work uh, for a good few years where we really, because the technology itself didn't exist at that time. Um, so we were basically hacking together prototypes uh, in order to validate uh, the impact on the, uh, the human experience. And we often just split that into two phases. Phase one, the initial phase, was all about uh, uh, providing spatial audio information about one's environment while out and about. And the initial set of trials that we carried out involved a person leaving a house in suburban Reading here in the UK, traveling a few hundred yards to a bus stop, making their way um, um, onto the bus, traveling on uh, the bus and making their way to town and making their way in and, uh, in and around uh, uh, town to a particular uh, destination. And uh, by cobbling together that technology in a way that allowed us to validate that experience and then have it also measured and reviewed by researchers at Guide Dogs, the feedback overwhelmingly was that uh, of the 17 measures that Guide Dogs researchers were looking at, 10 of those were significantly enhanced through Soundscape and um, in particular, uh, um, the uh, ability to be able to sort of cognitively map or relate to a particular space uh, orientation was massively improved. Those people had some level of residual vision, felt a greater sense of uh, empowerment. And the guide dog mobility instructors themselves also noticed that uh, you know, people were working with more purpose in their stride. They were more upright and they felt more confident. And some of the verbatim feedback that they themselves provided, the end users, they were using words like feeling more connected to a particular space or place that they were passing through, feeling more present uh, as well. And that's when we started to think really seriously about, well, how do those more intangible qualities of the experience, you know, how can we really build a soundscape experience around that? And it was during these reflections, we sort of realized that what we had done in phase one was to sort of take the existing paradigm, if you will, of uh, still giving a person pretty detailed turn-by-turn -turn instructions, you know, walk 20 yards, then turn left. And what we were finding was that uh, while people were saying, yeah, that's absolutely fine, it works really well, because I now have access to this additional layer of information 
you know, delivered in this innovative way. Nonetheless, we notice that uh, the moment you give a precise instruction like, like that, you immediately think 20 meters, that's maybe 30 steps, and the person will inwardly start counting steps and therefore perhaps be less attentive to the, uh, to the environment or what's going on around them. Just become closed in a little bit. So one of the fundamental sort of philosophical uh, transitions that we made into phase two was to move away from being prescriptive, move away completely from providing turn-by-turn route-based navigation, and instead focus on enhancing a person's appreciation and awareness of the environment by being more descriptive. And in many ways, relying on the natural capabilities that each of us have to build a map of a, uh, of, a, of a space, but on our own terms, because you can invoke when you want to uh, hear where you are, uh, what's around you, or what may be uh, ahead in a uh, particular direction. And because of the way the audio beacon worked, as it uh, did in the, the video with Amos and Emily, you place that virtual audio mark, that virtual audio sound, on where you want to go to. And of course, uh, that's going to place it in a straight line as the crow flies, but we're never going to walk in a straight line because uh, we have to make our way through intersections, left turns, right turns, around buildings and other obstructions and so on. But by placing a sound either directly ahead, if that's where you need to go, or to the left or to the right, the subtle suggestion is think about turning right or think about turning left. And of course, soundscape, uh, as you're approaching an intersection, will spatially call out uh, the roads ahead of you, that you'll know where they are. It'll tell you that you're getting closer because the distance counter will be getting uh, shorter and shorter. And in this way, empower a person to travel independently on their own terms. And the uh, validation exercise that we carried out uh, for phase two involved bringing 12 people to Reading, um, which is where we're based. It's a town of about 150,000 so people to the west of London. And uh, eight of those folks had never been to, uh, to Reading before. And we gave them a task of, uh, uh, you know, from where we started to make their way to a particular coffee shop and from there go to two other places to the town hall and finally back at the uh, the train station. And you know, everybody successfully did that. But equally, when we asked them to sort of spatially connect or sketch out the relative position of each of these items that we asked them to go to, all of them were pretty spot on. And that's where we sort of felt, yeah, this is the essence. This is in many ways the, uh, the sort of magic of soundscape in terms of empowering people to travel on their own terms and having that confidence, hopefully, or building that confidence over a period of time to uh, you know, go on routes that they haven't had to learn off by heart. And one of the things that we certainly encourage people to do is the first time you use Soundscape, just uh, you know, switch it on, put on your headphones, and just walk around a neighbourhood that you're familiar with. And once you've got automatic call-outs enabled, you'll just hear these call-outs um, from where they are in relation to you, and then slowly start using some of these uh, additional buttons. This slide reads, going on your first walk, examine your surroundings, walk around and listen to automatic callouts. A photo is shown of the Soundscape app showing four buttons, my location, around me, ahead of me, and nearby markers. Uh, and so on, and so particularly now, my can location. I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Is the accuracy better if it's an established business versus if I put a begin at the end of my driveway? Um, no, the accuracy really is dependent completely on GPS. And so Soundscape at the moment is, yes, predominantly for outdoor use. Uh, indoor, yeah, we're doing all sorts of, and have been doing all sorts of you know, explorations and forays into uh, indoor uh, uh, positioning. And you know, thankfully, compared to 10 years ago, that technology is now beginning to mature. But for the outdoor experience, we rely on GPS. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, we turned that audio beacon off about 10 to 15 meters before you arrive at your destination, simply because we know that uh, on average, we probably are getting in most places uh, between three to five meters of accuracy with GPS. It's improved considerably over the last uh, you know, five to seven years. But what we don't want to do is to make sort of false claims that we will directly take you to the door of a particular building because we know that within the margin of error 
that GPS operates in, we can get you pretty close. But maybe for those last sort of you know, five to 10 meters, they rely on your existing mobility skills. So we do realize that there is a gap. And we do realize, for example, that lots of people use seeing AI, seeing AI for example, that does require you to take the camera out, uh, take the phone out, use the camera, point it in a particular direction, which isn't always the, the most comfortable thing to do, particularly in a place that you're not familiar with. Um, but equally, what we didn't want to do was to sort of uh, create this false expectation that Sandscape's going to take you to the front door of where you want to get to every every single time. So we've learned to kind of um, work within the parameters of, of GPS and kind of work well enough that particularly when you're outdoors and there uh, isn't too much interference, you should have a pretty good, reliable uh, experience. Okay, that makes sense. And you actually answered my second question because I was just wondering, was there a way to to perfect it? Was there another step in the app to make it more accurate? Because I have noticed like between eight and 15 feet, that's the variance. And so you're saying that's pretty normal for now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And particularly in outdoors in open spaces, some of the work that we've been doing with adaptive sports, for example, uh, um, yeah, open spaces, clear line of sight to a number of satellites, it's actually really good. And uh, you know, quite often you'll get you know, sub three meter uh, accuracy uh, and so on. So for example, there's a particular bench that you may want to point to in a park, you'll, you'll get there more often than not. But yeah, those are some of the constraints that, uh, yeah, we, we sort of had to design Sciencecape around. Sure, okay, thank you. Um, wayfinding with audio beacons, I, can, I think I've explained this uh, hopefully, but there's a uh, nice little sort of uh, flashing little circle to illustrate to the uh, uh, front and right of a person where a particular sound may be uh, coming from in, in relation to them. And the great thing about Soundscape is that, uh, when I move on to this next slide, talking about different uh, sort of uh, headsets. Uh, the great thing about sort of Soundscape is that it works in order to get the spatial audio experience with any stereo headphones. And of the three that are shown here, at the top we've got the Sony Link Buds, which I'll come to in a minute, AirPods Pro at the at the bottom. The interesting about both of those is that they have sensors built in, which allow us to track which way your head is facing. And as a result of that, the spatialization that you'll hear will be far more dynamic and more responsive than it is, for example, when you're using uh, some bone conduction or standard set of uh, headphones, because then we rely on the sensors in the phone. The third set of headphones on the side are called shocks, S-H-O-K-Z. And we ask when you're out and about and you're walking, you're in motion, you can happily put your phone in your pocket and we'll infer from the sensors in the phone which way you're walking and which way your head is likely facing and then provide the spatialized call outs uh, from that. But when you're stationary at an intersection, for example, then we do suggest you know, taking your phone out, holding it flat, because then the sensors become a little bit more uh, reliable and they're subject to sort of less, uh, less interference. But certainly we've uh, also noticed that for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, we've introduced the, the sort of tactile or the haptic audio beacon. Some people, for example, we know only like to put one earbud in or one sort of uh, just have sound to one ear in which case, uh, just by pointing the phone and knowing that that's where the resonant beacon sound is coming from, that's where you'll uh, need to go. So we've tried to uh, accommodate as much as possible um, you know, uh, people who uh, um, uh, may be deaf or, or hard of hearing in some way as well. Um, the Link Buds, yeah, we've made, a, I think, quite a song and dance about uh, our collaboration with Link Buds simply because um, for us, they represented a really clever and innovative device because we've heard for so many years the reluctance that so many people have about putting something in their ear for fear of including the sounds of the outside world or dampening their ability to echolocate. And uh, with the link buds, even though that little donut shaped ring goes inside your ear, the trials that we've carried out and the feedback that uh, we've had working closely with Sony 
is that to all intents and purposes, the outside world isn't blocked out uh, at all, which is uh, which is pretty remarkable. And in fact, uh, you know, one of the people that we've been working with, uh, Daniel Kish, um, you know, rates these uh, really highly for uh, the amount of pass through that they actually uh, allow. The slide reads: Soundscape and Link Buds lighting up the world with sound. Sony Partnership announced 15th February 2022 a link to Sony's announcement and a link to the captioned video of user story will be available in the description box. A um, couple of other capabilities uh, that we sort of uh, alluded to in the video, the ability to be able to add personalized markers and then annotate them and then share them with, uh, with other folks. It's, I think, a really powerful feature as well because it allows you then to personalize a, a particular space or a... Uh, a route that um, uh, you, you you may travel on uh, frequently or, or may want to share with another person. The slide reads, add markers to important locations. The first bullet point, markers can be placed anywhere you want, on an address, on a specific location, on an existing POI. The second bullet point, optionally, give your marker a custom name and or add notes to your marker. The third bullet point, Markers make it easy to set audio beacons in the future. And the natural extension of that, in many ways, was to look at how we can create a route by taking a series of markers and then allowing you to sequence them in an order of your own choosing. So in many ways, it's a bit of a backdoor into route-based navigation, but without being prescriptive, and without providing turn by turn. All you're doing here is uh, basically sequencing up a series of markers and then through the uh, subsequent notes that you can provide you can provide more specific instruction on uh, what to watch out for or what to be aware of or what to move around and one of the key motivators for us building this capability was the collaboration that we've had with uh, orientation and mobility instructors you know, obviously right from the outset but over the last few years we created this little v-team of uh, O&Ms from um, Lighthouse in San Francisco, CNIB, uh, Guide Dogs here in the UK, um, and Vision Australia, um, just so that we had a nice cross-section of people from different parts of the uh, the world, bringing their own uh, perspective and uh, hopefully a new way of working with, uh, with their clients uh, as well. The slide reads, creating and sharing routes in Soundscape with five bullet points. One, Soundscape now lets you group your markers into routes. Two, when you start a route, a beacon will start on the first waypoint. Three, the beacon will automatically move from waypoint to waypoint. Four, routes are easy to share. Five, you can make and share them with family, friends, and even O&M instructors. And of course, within Soundscape, so much relies on the, uh, the, the listening experience. The ability to be able to choose a voice that uh, just works better for you. And some of the enhanced voices in iOS, for example, sound so much better than the initial robotic voices that we were uh, working with a few uh, years ago. And the ability to be able to choose from a range of different uh, uh, beacon uh, sounds as well. You know, some of them are quite musical, quite melodic. Some of them are quite sort of sharp and harsh and, and quite focused. And then finally, your ability to be able to vary the sound of the beacon, the sound of the voice, and the, uh, the sort of accompanying sound effects that uh, uh, come just before a call out that Soundscape uh, provides uh, as well. So we, we know that in uh, noisy environments, for example, some people have said the beacon is actually, uh, or the call outs are quite uh, um, not loud enough. So the ability then to uh, customize that on the fly, uh, I think. Uh, will hopefully uh, um, all matter to, uh, to a lot of people. Some of the new capabilities that we've been uh, working on over the last uh, sort of 12, 18 months, uh, Soundscape Street Preview, which allows you from the comfort of your own home to pretty much explore any place in the world. We often sort of describe this as, a, as an intersection uh, jumper. So, for example, if you did a search for um, Sydney Opera House, will uh, take you to the nearest intersection at Sydney Opera House. And then by you know, sitting on your chair and just swiveling and turning the phone around, you'll get the call out of the intersections. It's spatially related to each other as you turn around. 
And then you can choose to go down a particular road until the next intersection. Um, and in this way, we have so many people coming back to us uh, saying that they're using this to remotely familiarize themselves with the space before they actually go visit it uh, for themselves. One of the other capabilities, and this is currently in preview, is a web-based authoring tool that allows individuals, groups, partners, collaborators, service providers to uh, create guided uh, experiences, recreational experiences, uh, but in addition to uh, um, being able to provide basic information that you would get through creating a marker or a route, for example, through the authoring tool, you're able to provide uh, uh, an image or a series of images uh, to go along with a particular place, or some audio files, or some commentaries, uh, along with uh, text, of course, uh, as well. And we've done a range of different sort of uh, projects uh, with early adopters. Uh, one of our close collaborators of the last uh, couple of years is CRNA, a Capital Region Nordic Alliance based out of uh, New York State, who specialize in uh, adaptive sports, and in particular providing trail orienteering, hiking, and a whole host of other activities for people with disabilities. And they've had enormous success um, in creating these trail-based uh, experiences using the uh, the authoring tool, working with a whole range of different parks and recreation departments in the, uh, in the US. The, the tour guide experience I've, I've mentioned, you know, we've created scavenger hunts, uh, um, heritage trails. We did a piece of work here in the UK with uh, St. Albans High School for Girls where uh, they brought their town to life, incorporating you know, their key subject areas around science, technology, history, geography, art, and so on. But looked at the Roman, medieval, and the Victorian areas uh, of, of, of St. Albans. And then through sharing the QR code that's generated through the authoring tool, allowing other people to be able to access that. And I've mentioned before, our very close work with uh, O&M specialists using the tool who are... Uh, creating sharing groups and certainly some of the initial feedback that we're getting is uh, not only their ability to be able to work remotely with the client more effectively which of course we know was the norm um, you know, for the uh, the last few years um, but also how it's potentially accelerating learning and skills development because they don't have to wait a week or two weeks before they have their next follow on lesson they can start putting together structured training plans uh, far more effectively. And of course, by being able to work in this way, hopefully extend that reach to be able to reach uh, more uh, more people uh, as well. So in summary, uh, with Soundscape, immerse yourself in your surroundings and navigate effortlessly. God, it sounds like my uh, opening bio again, doesn't it? Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we hope to do with the uh, uh, technology. At the moment, we're available in the countries that I've listed here, the US, UK, Canada, Australia, Sweden, France, Brazil, Italy, Ireland, and Japan. We're hoping to be able to release in more countries, uh, Western Europe over the um, coming 12 months. And in many ways, the reason for us being cautious in this over the last few years is that each time we've released in a country, we've worked very closely with uh, the community there. And we wanted to make sure that the capabilities that we were that we started off with and that we were then building and growing over a period of time really worked and made a difference uh, for people. And in turn, the lessons, the feedback, the insights that we were getting, we were using that to drive our uh, our roadmap to the point now where we do feel that actually Soundscape uh, is a pretty solid uh, application. And some of the feedback that we've got about how it's transforming and transformed people's lives, their feeling about what they are now able to do versus what they may have felt before is and has been sort of enormously uh, uh, gratifying. And to sort of uh, close with this uh, slide, our aspiration is definitely reflected on the, uh, the picture on the right-hand side, which shows Melanie, one of the engineers on the team. She's heads up, engaged with the environment, um, not as on the left-hand uh, side of the picture here, showing a group of people crossing a busy intersection, pretty much everybody heads down, looking at their phone, not really paying attention, and they're crossing a bloody intersection. Um, yeah, 
and, and, and that in many ways is the uh, uh, it's the downside of technology, how it has this tendency to overtake our lives and be all consuming and all pervading. Whereas what we're trying to do with soundscape in many ways is to have it disappear almost, to blend into the background, to feel like a natural extension of our senses and, and of our capabilities. So I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. So we'll open it up for questions. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> I still have a lot of practice to do with, I'm an O&M specialist and I have used it um, on lessons, but I have a lot of practice to do still with just taking the time to learn all the features. But one of the things that, um, that I'd like to find out how to deal with is, um, you know, when we're in a business area and there's businesses all around, um, some of my students have um, complained that it's too much information. It's too much. Um, it's that it's just too many, too many sounds and too many <clears throat> descriptions of businesses. So um, I, I figured it's probably something I'm doing wrong. Or is is there any recommendations for for kind of managing that? Yeah, certainly. First of all, uh, that's, that's that's great feedback and feedback that uh, you know we've been hearing uh, um, quite uh, quite a lot of. Uh, one of the things that we've sort of slowly introduced is the ability to be able to configure which of the callouts you want to have on and which are the ones that you want to uh, turn off. So do have a play with those. I know that when we uh, initially started, it was like, oh God, this is so bloody noisy. You know, shut up. Um, I'm trying to listen here. Uh, and, and it's always a balance, uh, isn't it, Be, yeah. between trying to sort of uh, provide enough information that it makes sense without trying to provide too much information because there's so much going on around you versus not providing enough uh, information. So we're hoping certainly that with the ability to be able to configure the types of callouts that you want to uh, turn on and turn off, that you'll find a nice balance uh, between that. And we do know that in some really dense places, for example, when we're uh, walking around in London, it's on all the time. Um, if you turn out, if you live on um, all of the call outs. Uh, so we yeah, naturally turn off uh, a few things. I see. So I have the ability when I, if I configure a route ahead of time, I can configure it so it doesn't call out other things? Oh, no, that's a great point, and it's a great uh, distinction. So Soundscape, literally out of the box, if you go into the settings, and then the uh, the automatic sort of call-outs configuration, you'll be able to make that uh, preference setting there. If you're creating a route, then the route that you're creating um, will basically be called out as you arrive at each one of those waypoints in turn, and if you've provided an annotation, it will read that out. But you do have to be careful then, because certainly you want that route to be primary when you're working with the client. So in that case, have a play with the settings call outs because you don't want them interfering with maybe the instruction or the guidance that you want your learner to pay attention to at that particular point in time. So that, I think, will require a little bit of uh, think about with trial and error until you find the balance that works best for uh, uh, the folks that you're working with. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. That's helpful. Well, I'm going to hop on with another one. I was helping a gentleman with his find his sidewalk and it was it was in a neighborhood where every single there were apartments, I guess more duplexes and every single one looked like the next. So there was a driveway and then a sidewalk and it was a little bit of a little bit difficult for him to find the exact sidewalk, but would it be a good idea to set two beacons, like one at the driveway and then one at the sidewalk? Would that would that help, or would it make it worse? Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. One of the things that we have sort of thought about is introducing another beacon into play. So you hear, you know, where, for example, you may set your destination to, and then another beacon in relation to that, or uh, um, it's, it's not something that we've yet had a chance to sort of experiment with or research in greater detail, but it's certainly something that's been floating around our heads for uh, for a while. In the uh, particular case of um, 
uh, the uh, there's a sidewalk in every single building looking the same. Um, in, in that particular case, I mean, is the sidewalk narrow? Is it sort of close enough to the sidewalk on the other side of the street that it might be causing confusion? Because once again, that potentially will come down to a GPS issue, particularly in narrow roads. And, and, and of course, um, if you look at existing mapping systems, for example, they're based around car drivers rather than pedestrians. So everything is basically set in the middle of the road. And a lot of the uh, the sort of uh, um, um, call out to point of interest uh, are, are kind of based on that uh, configuration. So the environment, to some extent, is going to determine where that beacon, for example, is going to be predominantly placed for the uh, uh, for the sidewalk or uh, being able to distinguish one building uh, from another. Um, so there's no really clear cut and obvious and, and, and straightforward answer, uh, I'm afraid. It's one of those sort of challenges that the environment throws up. But here, a marker with an annotation kind of describing what's going on and maybe setting the user's expectation that you know, watch out for this or, or, or um, um, I don't know, if there's something else that you can sort of attach yourself to in the environment or associate yourself with in the environment, that might uh, uh, be a useful um, aid or guide in that case. Okay. Any other sort of questions, thoughts, uh, feedback? I was just wondering, um, like approximately how long would you, even though everybody's different, of course, um, but approximately how long before you would say a person gets comfortable using this and feels like this is a good, um, you know, tool to use and they feel, they feel comfortable using it. Gosh, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a great, uh, great question. And here, I think the most important thing is use it often, use it frequently. You don't necessarily have to use it for extended periods of time, but building up that, um, uh, building up those minutes of usage, particularly in the first few weeks, I think is really important. Because initially it's going to appear completely alien and completely different to anything that the person would have come across before. Right. And it takes time to get accustomed to call out coming from outside of your head and coming from where objects or landmarks are in relation to you. And it takes time to adjust and adapt to that. Um, so what I would certainly encourage is not to sort of uh, go overboard and think, you know, I'm going to spend the next couple of hours um, because there's so much to take in and there's uh, there's so much to get familiar with. So I would certainly suggest, uh, you know, really, Use it a little, but use it often and use it regularly. Okay. That and makes then slowly sense. build up those minutes over time. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Hi, this is Shirley. I have a question. <laughs> um, yeah. Is there, are there resources online, videos for training, or even like maybe a recommended progression of how to introduce this to students or even for ourselves to learn? Got um, uh, some overview descriptions of the uh, the features. We've got a couple of videos. There's a the video on the uh, the homepage that provides that five minute overview. On the features tab, there's a video that provides um, a deep dive into the roots feature. And I think another thing that's probably worth uh, looking at is in the uh, news and articles tab. We've probably produced about I don't know ten or fifteen different blogs that describe the different features of, uh, of Soundscape. And uh, these have been uh, written by uh, members of the uh, the team um, and also by some external collaborators, some of the O&Ms that we've been working with as well about how they use Soundscape. Uh, so there's a ton of information there. So do take your time to sort of look into it. We don't, unfortunately, this is something that we do get asked a lot by the O&M community, is there a structured training plan? Um, this is something that we unfortunately haven't had the time to do, but uh, uh, it's something that we have been uh, looking into. Cool. And if any questions are come to mind um, after the session, then please feel free to drop us a note at uh, soundscape uh, at microsoft.com. 
All right. Well, thank you, Darnell. Thank you for your time and expertise. We appreciate it. That's, yeah, my pleasure. And thank you once again uh, for the opportunity. And uh, of course, uh, I encourage you to uh, carry on using Soundscape and uh, yeah, do continue to share your feedback with us. The logo for the Kansas State School for the Blind, Fade to Black.